Hello and welcome everyone to all of our beloved City Church locations, our friends and family in person, whether you're new here online, on the podcast, thanks for being with us in these few moments. I'm excited for our future at Beloved City Church. God is preparing us as a body of believers, opening new pathways, illuminating, nudging, moving. God is so good. For those of us that don't like change and transition, we have another opportunity to look to God in this near future, to to the God of our hope as our provider, as our forgiver and leader, to trust him for his provision, believing for the impossible, readying our hearts and our minds so that we can engage with his purposes in the earth. Can you imagine that, you know, I, I, I just set up my tent and the cloud is already moving. The pillar of fire is already moving. Oh man, kids, family, get the goat. Let's go. God is moving. And that's from one of the ancient Hebrew, ancient Hebrew parts of the big story we find in the collection of books we call the Bible today, God's grand love story. When God moved, he moved as a pillar of, uh, as a cloud and a pillar of fire and, and, the, and the children of God were moving through the wilderness. Through the day. Sometimes it feels like us, doesn't it? But we trust in God that as he moves, we want to notice, we want to be prepared, and God is moving. <laughs> oh, it's so good to be part of what God is doing. Today, we actually call it faithing, walking by faith, not by sight. We try so hard to see ahead, to tell the future. We look to all kinds of means and methodologies and sciences to, to look at the stars and like, what is God going to do in the future of my life? But instead, we can live in the moment right here and right now, and we call it faith. Live by faith, friends. How many of you here believe that God is still moving in our midst? Let your will be done, God, and not mine. And by the way, thanks. Don't forget to say thanks, God. I believe, as I was sitting in my living room talking with Pastor Angela, my wife, last week, I I, I sensed God say something to the effect of, my people have a problem with receiving. I stopped in the middle of our conversation that we were having, and I looked at my wife, Angela, and I said, we have a problem with receiving. And she said, who, us? Maybe. I sensed, though, that God wants us to consider what it means to receive. Some of you are already logging into your Amazon account right now and ready to purchase that item. Finally, God is going to send me the resources that I need so that I can get that one thing I've been dreaming of from my wish list. It's been there for days already. Well, well, maybe. However, I believe it is deeper than your Amazon wish list, of course. Your car payment, your new job, your investment funds, that maybe person that you're looking at through the corner of your eye, maybe that would be my future spouse or something. Who knows? The ability to buy a house in this outrageous market. Hey, I get it. That health concern that you've had nagging your body for the past two years. Yes, I believe it goes deeper than these even. I truly believe that God wants you to receive something from him that is so much bigger and holistic than the things that are restricted by our temporal and physical world and bodies. Would anybody else be willing to explore what it means to receive from God today? Over the next couple of weeks, as we're leading up to the Easter season, we will explore through this mini series of talk episodes what it means to receive, more importantly, to receive from God. Here's the problem. It is hard to receive. It's actually harder to receive, friends, than it is to give. Some of you might, yeah, right, we'll see. But I took a a peek at some Canadian statistics, and I think this is interesting, to see what our giving trends are as Canadians. And here's what I found. In in 2020, according to Canada Help's website, the charitable sector employs 1.5 million Canadians full-time a year. That's 10% of the Canadian workforce is employed by the charitable sector. Overall, Canadians give 1.6% of their income to charity every year. Canadians 55 plus give almost twice as much as Canadians aged 25 to 54. People who are aged 55 plus gave $6.9 billion to charity in 2019, actually. People aged 25 to 54 gave $3.5 billion to charity. Still generous. Amazing, right? Big difference, though, but still generous. There are 30,000 plus charitable organizations in Canada alone, from healthcare to animal foundations to education funds, religious, social services, environmental, and so much more. We, as Canadians, we love to give. Canada is filled with charitable countrymen and women. We are so blessed. We are set up to be a blessing to those around us. We love to give, and yet... We still have a problem with receiving. We grew up with influences, whether 
you're from a church background or churching history or, or without a churching background, doesn't matter. Many of us grew, grew up believing that it is better or more noble to give than to receive. Somehow, this lesson was to, to safeguard us from becoming self-centered or self-indulgent monsters, right? Scanning our environments and circles of influence to see what we could possibly extract from others to fill ourselves. <laughs> I don't think it worked that well, though. We just learned how to mask our selfishness or self-indulgence to be able to manipulate it into control. One of the things that even our pop psychology world has recognized is that giving living in the moment, sorry, from within the posture of gratitude or recognizing others' needs and honoring others' uh, feelings and, and being responsive and empathetic to the, to the less fortunate around us safeguards us from the unbridled narcissism that runs so rampant in our hyper-individualistic culture. Yet, we also have come to note that burnout is a real issue, it's a real thing, right? Giving until there is nothing left to give. Maybe some of you have been in that posture. I know I have. Emptied, over-prioritizing giving without recognizing the priority of receiving. I can fill up my car with gas, enjoy the freeway, breeze in my hair, get around and do my business. And, and if I don't stop at a fuel station every so many kilometers, my useful vehicle will be sitting on the side of the road. What was designed to be a useful tool in the right hands is now waiting on the side of the road to be refilled to have a renewal of fuel in its tank so that it can continue to be the tool that I need it to be, right? Furthermore, what you experience in the natural, friends, our humanity is also affecting your spirituality, your spiritual man, and vice versa. Our body, soul, and spirit are inseparable, integrated. It's one. You, until we die, what I put into my body affects my soul and my spirit. What I put into my soul, which is, again, the soul is the handbasket that, that holds my mind, will, and emotions. It affects my body and spirit, what I put into my soul. Maybe you have, heard, you have had a hard time accepting compliments. Uh, kind words or gratitude shown towards you. Maybe you, you squirm and you feel all awkward when someone says, I love you or gives you a gift. You might say, you didn't have to. Or, hey, I love how you do that. Oh, gosh, be darn it. You're so kind. I don't even know how. We, we have a hard time taking compliments, don't we? Oh, you know, it's no big deal. Oh, man, we say that all the time, don't we? Difficult for you to receive love and care and nurture and affirmation. Some of you are really good at receiving, I know. And you allow yourself to, to deeply receive a gift of kindness, care, and connection. And you respond with deep and genuine and authentic gratitude. Some of you are awesome at that. But let's briefly take a look at the five possible reasons that psychologist Dr. John Amadeo describes in writing about in his book about intimacy and a path towards spirituality. Because some of us are really good at receiving and we allow ourselves to receive with kindness. And some of us are not good at receiving at all. But let's see what five possible reasons why receiving is often harder or more difficult than giving. Now, I know we're going to take a little bit of a science approach here in the first few minutes, but we're going to get to some scripture and see what Jesus has to say about this as well. Number one, out of the five reasons why receiving is often harder than giving <laughs> or more difficult. Number one is defense against intimacy. See, receiving creates connection. Prioritizing giving over receiving may be a way to keep people distant from you and from your hearts, and you're putting your hearts in a posture of defense. To the extent that we actually fear intimacy, we may actually disallow ourselves from receiving a gift or compliment, thereby depriving ourselves of a precious moment of connection. See, receiving creates connection. Number two is letting go of control. I know, I know, we all love to control things, don't we? When we give, we're in control in a certain way, right? You got to pick out the perfect present to give to that person. They didn't have any say in it. <laughs> it might be easy to offer a kind word or buy someone flowers, but, it, but can we allow ourselves to surrender to the good feeling of receiving a gift? And to what extent does our giving actually come from a generous heart versus promoting our self-image of being a caring person, letting go of control. Receiving invites us to welcome a vulnerable part of ourselves. Let me say that again. Receiving invites us to welcome a vulnerable part of ourselves. You want vulnerability? Learn how to receive. Living in this tender place, we're, we're, we're more available to receive the gifts we're offered every day. 
such as a sincere thank you or a smile, a compliment, warm smile. Mm, love it. Number three, fear of strings attached. How many of you, when that person calls you or that person shows up at your door and they, they got a gift, you know, man, there's, there's, you're looking, there's 25 strings attached somewhere. We may be uncomfortable receiving if it comes with strings attached, of course. When growing up, we may have received compliments or only when we accomplish something like excelling at sports or achieving good grades. If we sense that we weren't being accepted for who we really are, but rather for who, what we did or our accomplishments, then receiving may be, may be tinged by the continuing need to perform in your life, which is a distasteful way to live, right? If parents and or, or caregivers or boyfriends or girlfriends, husbands, wives, whatever, narcissistically used us to meet their own needs, such as to showcase us to their friends or on their highlights, on their reels, or whatever it might be, we may equate compliments to being used. We were recognized for what we do rather than for who we really are. Strings attached, right? Are you beginning to see how important it is to permit Jesus into the center of our identity? Our thoughts and emotions transformed by the Holy Spirit. But wait a second, aren't we having a hard time or difficulty in receiving? Right, even spiritually? Yes, we are. Thanks for clarifying that. We'll get there in a few moments. Number four. We believe it is selfish to receive. See, our religious and spiritual backgrounds may have taught us that we're selfish if we receive, that life is more about suffering than being happy. It's better to be self-effacing and not take up too much space or smile too broadly, lest we bring too much attention to ourselves. As a result of this conditioning and poor theology, by the way, we might feel shame in receiving. See, narcissistic entitlement which is an inflated sense of self-importance and believing we deserve more than others, that's what narcissistic entitlement is, is rampant today. Interestingly enough though, studies and research studies research suggests that wealth can actually increase this sense of entitlement. But the perils of destructive narcissism might be contrasted with healthy, positive self-regard which reflects sound self-worth, right? And the ability to gratefully enjoy the pleasure of receiving. Receiving with what? With humility and appreciation. Living with a rhythm of giving and receiving keeps us healthy and nourished. We're talking about the problem of receiving today. Why receiving is often harder or more difficult than giving. You may have, number five, a self-imposed pressure to reciprocate. Oh, they gave me a gift. I must buy them. They, oh, I, they spent 25. I'm going to spend 35. But these are blocks to receiving, which may, uh, may be a way to protect us from being in someone's debt, per se. We may suspect their motives or wondering, mm, what do they want from me? Presuming that compliments or gifts are attempts to control or manipulate you. Or, so what do we do? We are preemptively, we preemptively defend ourselves from any sense of obligation or indebtedness by not opening ourselves up to receive the gift. If you are busy and concerned only with giving, then when are you available to receive all the good stuff that this, that this life has to offer you? Not just your, this life, but even God himself. By receiving with tender and genuine self-compassion, we're allowing ourselves to be touched by life's gifts and humanity around us. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually healthy. Right? That's what we're talking about. Ah, we need to develop healthy rhythms of giving and receiving or receiving and giving. We have built and erected all kinds of brick walls in our lives from negative beliefs and emotional wounds around receiving. We really have. God wants to bring healing though in this time in our lives today. I believe this is from God today. Why do we try to disintegrate ourselves when we could be living as integrated and whole humans we, we, we live fragmented and disintegrated instead of living as integrated and whole. In relationship to a good God, our Lord and Creator who created us this way, He does care about your physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Your healthy rhythms of giving and receiving helps you maintain and grow in a physical, emotional, and spiritual healthy way. Now, there is a difference between receiving and being a taker. <laughs> when we disallow ourselves from receiving in a deeply felt way, our longing doesn't disappear, right? It often curdles 
into something much more demanding. We begin evaluating other people to see if they meet our expectations for being a worthy friend or partner. We administer secret little tests of loyalty determined to determine whether or not we want to stay in relationship with that person or run. Our heart goes into hiding as our ego craves a sense of being gratified in ways that don't really satisfy our soul. See, in our human relationships, we all know one and have been around a taker. Maybe we've even been one ourselves, someone or even ourselves, right? Experiencing symptoms from our inability to receive. That's what it is. Having the inability to, to feel and express appreciation and gratitude for what we have been given or what we are receiving. Taking the kindness and caring of others for granted. Leaving others feeling unappreciated, ignored, left unread. Ah, I can't stand being left unread. But it, anyway, that's the way it works, right? Sometimes we also treat God in similar ways, don't we? Mm, the problem of receiving. An environment for intimacy is created as we begin to appreciate what we're given. And while we engage in a, uh, this loving dance and, and rhythm of mutuality, we talk about the body of Christ as being mutuality, togetherness. It's not five separate hands. It's the body with the hands attached to it, beautifully designed to live and operate and function in togetherness and mutuality for grand purposes that is beyond what we even understand. Sometimes. Not as fragmented and selfish individualistic pieces and parts, in separation, but assembled, not divided in our attentions, rhythms, and attitudes towards one another, especially, but in love and in unity, a genuine and authentic common unity, which is what the word we get community from. It's a common unity. It's existing together. We're to get one piece, one body in Christ Jesus. And hey, if you are experiencing ingratitude or, or disunity or hurt or dysfunctional rhythms or maybe you're captivated by sin and shame and brokenness and hurt what do we do well james talks about this in the book in the new testament portion of this collection of books we call the bible james chapter 5 and 16 says what do we do we confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Mm. But I think it's really important to note the effective prayer of a righteous person. This is someone who recognizes the grounds of his righteousness actually resides in Jesus. And whose personal walk is generally consistent with the righteousness that he has in Jesus. This is the fervent prayers of a righteous man. James goes on to explain, like Elijah, a fervent man, he says, not lukewarm, not cold, but fervent in prayer, in hot, in his relationship, in our relationship, and our trust in God. Not because God is reluctant, that's not why he's saying to be fervently in your prayer, but because we are fervent and hot for the things that he is fervent and hot for. Revelations 3.16, if you want to read that on your own. If you've been a taker, in its stead, instead, be a reacher, friends. Reaching for, it's not a passive and neutral approach to walking by faith. It's hot and fervent. There's action involved. You are reaching. And we're going to talk more about that over the next couple of weeks, about reaching in on our next episode. Now, I know for some bibliocentric leaning listeners might ask today, well, what about the scripture found in the Acts of the Apostles in Acts 20 and 35? Paul quotes Jesus actually from his sermon on the beautiful attitudes or the Beatitudes in saying it is more blessed to give than to receive. Mm -hmm. When when I began digging into uh, this context a little bit deeper, scriptures like this one came to mind, of course. Yet in context, when you look and you read this in context, he's talking to the ministers in the church, the pastors and leaders of the church. He was concerned about teaching ministers of the church in the context of the local church, caring for the church as overseers of the church that God bought with his own blood to do what? To watch out for them, to watch from uh, for outside wolf-like predators is what we're watching for, for spiritual or human, and to watch for those who rise up inside of the church who will speak twisted or perverted things to draw away the disciples of Jesus after themselves. We call it cult followings today. But Paul's teaching uh, the church leaders to be more concerned with what they can give their flock than about what their flock can give them. So we must receive life 
light and love from the giver of these good gifts. Not from one another so much as it's from God first receiving life, light, and love instead of looking to one another as our sustaining life givers dependence on God rather than codependent relationships with each other. That's not healthy. This is the Jesus way. Dependence on him. Now, what I'm not saying is receiving Trump's gifting. That's not what I'm saying. Your integrity does, though. <laughs> your integrity trumps your gifting. Always trumps your gifting. See, a cracked wineskin is weak and breaks and spills out its contents all over the floor. A wineskin that is renewed and rubbed with oil, this is a leather kind of wineskin, a vessel that has integrity or holds its contents and is usable for what it was actually designed for, right? Talking about the rhythms of receiving and giving, here's what I'm trying to lay down for you at this table today. It is not a balance thing. We hear that quite often. Now oh, life's about balance my life, blah, blah, blah. No, we are not people, friends, of the yin and the yang. We're not trying to find a balance. It's not a balance that Jesus has called us to. It's an all-in centricity with Jesus at the center of everything that we do in our marriage, in our houses, our finances, our kids, and our jobs, our studies. It's not a balancing. It's, a, it's all about my rhythms and passions and motivations and desires, my patterns, concentered in Christ Jesus. It's, it's an all in. Christ is the way or he's not. Christ is the life or he's not. Christ is the truth or he's not. There's no neutrality. It's not maybe or come see, come saw. It's a life lived as a fully devoted follower of Jesus with a willingness to die for it. That's how good this life with Jesus is. <laughs> Yet, you will never be able to give if you are unable to receive, if you cannot receive, it is a both and. It's a rhythm. Some of us have no problem giving and some of us don't mind receiving. But most of us have a problem with the ability, ability to do both well. And it's usually because we have a problem with receiving. Therefore, unable to live in a posture that is able to, and resource that has the strength and integrity to, to maintain the consistency and continuity of giving without what? Without receiving. You can't keep giving when you run out of what you are giving. So, from whom can we receive then? Who fills us up? Where do we get this from? Who is the giver of such life-giving gifts? What I can receive. In the Gospel of John, it is recorded that John, the baptizer in John 3 and 27 says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless God bestows it, unless God gives it. And John, in his recordings of the, of the good news of Jesus, demonstrated this greatness of humility, preparing the way from, for the rescuer and Messiah. Jesus postured himself in humility to receive what was being given from heaven. Friends, we must learn to receive with humility before we can give. That is why we at Beloved City Church, we talk about receiving the gift of Christ, receiving his great love and grace, receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving the spirit of adoption, receiving his forgiveness. You cannot give forgiveness if you have not received forgiveness. You cannot give love if you have never received love. And you cannot lead others if you have not received his leadership. Why? On our own strength, out of our own wisdom, Humanity is unable to give without receiving from the giver himself. Every good and perfect gift comes from heaven. The author and follower of Jesus, James, in the book of James 1 and 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. From our Father and Creator friends who made the sun, the moon, and the stars. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. From our own fallen natures and from those who would entice us, we expect no true goodness in gifts like our Heavenly Father can give. But every good and every perfect gift comes from God, our Father and Creator in heaven. That is why we choose, like in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16, to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, talk to him without ceasing. Give thanks in all of our circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, friends. Do not despise the prophetic and the prophecies and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. Mm. And of course, 
the ultimate goodness of any gift must be measured on an eternal scale. Sometimes that may seem to be only good, such as winning a lottery, actually may in fact be turned out to our destruction, right? God's goodness is constant though. There is no variation within him. It doesn't run out. And instead of shadows that move with the waning light of day, God is not like that. God is the father of lights. And in the ancient Greek grammar, James actually wrote the father of the lights. The specific lights are the celestial bodies that light up the sky both day and night. The sun, moon, and stars, they never turn off. Even when we can't see them. Even so, friends, even when you can't see what God's doing and what God's giving you. Even so, there's never a shadow with God. He is consistently a giver of good gifts but you need to learn how to receive. Mm. And by the way, it's not a once and done deal, friends. From a posture of receiving, we are continually engaging in the rhythms of receiving and giving. We are conduits, pipelines, wellsprings of the living God. We receive as he forever gives. Luke chapter six, one of the gospels according to Luke, says this in verse 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. See, the glory of God revealed in this earth through Jesus Christ. And again, now through the Holy Spirit living in you and I. We must first understand to receive the glory of God before we can be the conduit of his glory. The gift of God keeps giving. There's no change. He doesn't change. He's not stopped. (laughs) It's running over, friends. The more I use it, the more it's measured back to me. The glory of God does not run out. Therefore, I must keep receiving as I'm giving. I am receiving. It is a relationship relationship with the person, with the giver of gifts, with Christ himself. These good and perfect gifts comes from our Father, and it doesn't run out. I give, I receive. I give, I receive. It's not transactional. It's an attitude. It's a posture. It's a revelation of love. It's a rhythm, friends. In John's revelation of Jesus, uh, Jesus was disciplining the church in Ephesus, actually, saying, you have worked hard. You look good on the outside. You're giving and doing lots of really churchy things, but you have left your first love. Well, why is this important? Revelations 2 and 4 4 says, But I have this against you, church in Ephesus, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Now, this is what's important. So often we walk in our relationship with God much like our hookup culture prescribes today, right? I take, I give when it when it suits me. I guard my own heart by erecting walls to keep me from receiving and, and I don't want commitment and covenant. Nah, that's inconvenient for my desires, of course. And in this action of abandoning our first love, I end up t- trying really hard to love myself. And I keep coming up short. I keep coming up empty-handed and needing to be recharged all the time and refreshed and filled. Love who? Love is a who, friends. Who was given to us first? God is love. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son from whom we received so great a love. And we sometimes abandon him for whatever cheap distraction comes along our way. Yet we can return to the heart of our father. We can return to our first and covenantal love that we have received. We can repent of our self-indulgent ways of living and faithing. And we can turn our eyes and face back to him our attention to Jesus and receive so great a love again today to receive his spirit of adoption maybe for the first time for you to receive his grace and forgiveness Mm, to receive his redirection in my life and for your life to receive his glory receive that you may be a wellspring of living water a gift that keeps giving Jesus was preaching one day as recorded in the gospel account of John 7 and 37, Jesus stood up and cried, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, when you receive Christ, you're receiving Christ. It doesn't stop. It's not a once and done. You are receiving him. And from out of you will there be abundant flowing rivers of living water. This is the glory of God revealed in the earth in us, friends. We must be in a posture of receiving and allow the Holy Spirit to receive and give and receive and give through us. Now, this is beautiful. I love it. Now, this he said about the Spirit, for whom those who believed in him were about to receive. For as yet, the Spirit has not been given. At this time when Jesus was talking about it, Jesus was not yet glorified. He hadn't been um, killed and resurrected again at that point yet. So he says, come and drink, receive. 
me, receive me, receive my spirit, and out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. I receive Christ and the very mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit, and I become a wellspring of life to those around me in the circles of it, and even my own life. Maybe it doesn't sound intelligent enough for you, or wise, or it's hard to understand, mystical, maybe it's hard to understand. So often we attempt to think our way through life, right? Great, I love it. Actually, I think it would be better put as we often overthink our lives. <laughs> we worry, are filled with anxieties and doubt, and tend to try to control much of our lives and those of others and the outcomes of it, of course. We overthink. I love that we can use our mind. It's beautifully designed. However, there is a better way. There is a key to walking in wisdom that's not yours. And you can receive this wisdom that's given to you. We're talking about the problem of receiving today. Paul, he talks about this key in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Pay attention to how you're walking. Not as unwise, but as wise. Okay, right? Making the best use of the time because the days are evil, right? Therefore, don't be foolish, he says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Wisdom being filled, receiving Filled with the Holy Spirit, friends, is the key to walking in wisdom. This is in contrast to being in, being drunk with wine. Paul uses drunkenness in this letter. Don't allow wine to color your vision, to affect your choices and reasoning. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, which in many ways will bring you to a point of relinquishing control, much like alcohol does in so many ways, in the same way that being drunk does, right? But, if, but it, it will have life transforming effects in your life when you're filled with the Holy Spirit instead because receiving and being filled with the Spirit is the key to wisdom. Too often we apply human reasoning to aspects of our lives and, and even kingdom ventures that we're on and yet human wisdom is not the key to understanding and walking in the kingdom and cannot take you into kingdom promises. The key is being filled with the Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is the key in your life. Allow the Spirit to color your thinking, your feeling, your seeing, all of your senses. Allow the Spirit to fill you, to overwhelm you. Will you receive, my friends? So often we ask God for wisdom, but what we are actually asking God for is the ability to think better, to rationalize better, to be better prepared. No, friends. If you need wisdom, I invite you today, even in this moment, to receive the Holy Spirit, to invite the Holy Spirit to overwhelm you, to let him fill you with his Spirit. It's his wisdom, and you can receive his wisdom today. So as I talk about receiving the Holy Spirit, we must understand the intention of the Spirit. It is not that it's some party trick or, or magic wand, or but the intention of the Holy Spirit is to so empower us so that as we go through every step of this life, we are thinking in line with the kingdom of heaven. We are realigned with heaven in the mind of Christ. We have been given the mind of Christ and we start walking out our decisions in unreasonable ways according to the wisdom of man, but in kingdom promise achieving ways that we may live in his purposes and intentions for us. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let this mind of Christ be in you so that you may walk and live as Christ. That's Philippians chapter 7. This is is the glory of God revealed in the earth, friends. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let this mind of Christ be in you so that you may walk and live as Christ. Why do we want to receive? Receiving creates connection. Receiving helps us surrender control. Receiving helps us to know who we really are. Receiving helps us to devote, to, to, to develop, I should say, humility and appreciation. And by receiving, we're allowing ourselves to be touched by God's good gifts. This affects our lives physically, emotionally, and spiritually in a healthy way. Last, I'm going to wrap up here today, but put a bookmark in this portion of our learning, and we'll continue into next week as we continue to explore what it means to receive from the greatest giver of gifts. Receive, friends. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross and making a way for me to be in relationship with you. Mm, thank you for absorbing my sins and shame, for healing my hurt and brokenness. I choose to receive this extravagant gift of life and ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord and leader of my entire life. Oh, Jesus, I give you all of me, and I ask you to lead my life for your glory. Fill me with your spirit today and help me to live the life that you died to give me. 
Show me how to activate your word in my life. Another gift that you've given me. Reveal to us where we can walk in freedom. Another gift that you have given me. I want to receive that freedom that you've designed me to walk in. Holy Spirit, reveal any areas in my life that grieves you or has reduced my interaction with your presence, has distracted me from your presence in my life. Help us to align ourselves with your will, your truths, and your pathways. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, so good. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer with me for the first time and you would like to declare Jesus as your forgiver and leader, let us know. We would love to walk with you as you explore what it means to walk with Jesus and his body. If you'd like to publicly declare your decision to follow Jesus by being baptized as Jesus commanded, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Let us know. We would love to walk that out with you at Beloved City Church. Church, we are so passionate about what God has called us to do to grow a thriving and life-giving church in this city that is centered around Jesus, learning and exploring what it means to be a follower, a devoted follower of Jesus, making an impact that lasts into eternity. Will you take a step to partner your time, energy, and finances with us at Beloved City Church? Help us grow the day-to-day -day ministries of Beloved City Church here and now. Here's how you can join our big table family, make it official, join the family, sign up for the next family discovery night, discover what it means to be a family member of this local church. Another one, join the growth team and help serve others. Work alongside the team at Beloved City Church. And third, but last but not least, friends, will you prayerfully consider worshiping God with your money by giving financially here at Beloved City Church? Help us grow a dynamic Jesus-centered church in this city in Jesus' name. Friends, we love you. We are praying for you. May Jesus reveal himself to you in a special way today. Will you be postured to receive from God in this week? Amen.